Pink Floyd had quite a song that was called Money, Money, Money. Maybe when you heard that opening, we should have just had coins dropping. But uh, what we'd like to do during this exploring Catholicism is to search for a deeper meaning of money, especially in the great gift and spirituality of tithing. You can see it in the Bible. One of the first encounters of Abraham with Melchizedek is one in which in order to adore the Lord, in order to praise God, Abraham gave a tenth of everything that he had. And you can see that within the biblical context of a covenant and how one of the great gifts that we have is our treasures and how those treasures, when shared with the people of God, can enrich our world. And that's the type of spirituality that I felt coming into this great grouping in a very special way at Saints John and Paul. You can't help but to see the beauty of our campuses, the glory of all these wonderful things that we have is based upon that basic uh, gift of so many parishioners blessing us with their hard-earned money, their hard-earned time, in order to be able to build this beautiful uh, parish that, that we have. And so I thought it was fitting to just look at one specific Bible passage that might be the image that, that we could consider here. And that was when Jesus uh, looked out at the masses. He saw over 5,000 people, and he wanted to feed them. He could have just fed them just by, you know, zinging them with fish and McDonald's hamburgers and pizza and things. But what did he do? He went to somebody and he said, I, can I have your loaves and fishes? And with that, they donated to Jesus. And through that, Jesus empowered his apostles to then to multiply those gifts through the people and the feeding of the thousands with the loaves and the fishes. And in some sense, that's the great gift that we have an opportunity to discuss today, how our tithe and how our wonderful gifting of the blessings we've been given multiply so much when united to God's grace for the good of his kingdom in our church. So let's just start with a very simple prayer. Father God, you are the giver of all good things, and your word makes clear that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We ask that you accept all the gifts that we've been blessed with for your greater glory. May these gifts bring shelter to the homeless, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, hope to the hopeless, and Jesus' sacraments to our people. Just as you multiplied the offering of fish and loaves that were freely given for others, we pray that you would multiply these our offerings to you and others, so that through your kingdom and through these blessings, we can continue with the great mission of getting many people to heaven as possible. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Well, it's awesome to be able to welcome to the program here two superstars on our finance council. And you'll notice there's a little difference in terms of experience and background. And I think it's the convergence, just as you can see in the rivers of Pittsburgh, two rivers coming together to form just such a great gift that we have in the Golden Triangle. And I think you'll feel that today with um, our finance council members here, Lauren Williams and Joe Nowak. So Lauren and Joe, welcome to the program. It's exciting to have you both here. Joe, we'll start with you since you have the experience here. We want to make sure that we honor those who have helped build this tremendous uh, parish. Uh, what what brought you to Saints John and Paul from the beginning? Well, was it a family thing? Was it something that you just kind of ended up driving up here? How did you get to learn about Saints John and Paul even before it was kind of even conceived? We moved back to Pittsburgh in 1990, and we were going to St. Alphonse and St. Ferdinand. I wasn't sure where we wanted to end up. And then in 94, the Bishop set up a new parish. Uh, we were living in Marshall Township. We were included, and Monsignor Donardo was assigned. So he had a meeting at St. Alphonsus School with the new prisoners, and he asked people, when would you like your masses? And we started. <laughs> and we had a, offices across the street in the Specter Building where he started out. Diocese had built, bought 12 acres. Eight of it was only buildable for us to put up a church. And he started right away putting up a new church. And we had uh, about, uh, I don't know, about uh, 600 prisoners that were registered. Some of them didn't come, obviously, to begin with. And then uh, by, that was in 94. And by a couple of years later, uh, Francina Donardo had this building put up. And I have to give him credit for two things that a lot of people don't realize that 
he realized this was just going to be a worship center. He never had it dedicated as a church. He knew 15 years later we were going to build a big new church. Mm. And the other thing he did is uh, there were some stained glass windows available from a church in Oak Point about the same time we were building our church. And he asked the bishop if he could have those. And we did, and we put him in a limestone mine for 10 years up in Wampum, and our architect designed a church around those stained glass windows. So the actual uh -huh. church that we're in today were those stained glass windows that uh, with those stained glass windows. Yeah, they, it's uh, 16 windows of the life for Christ if you go around our church and see oh, those. That's amazing. And, yeah, it is. And it's beautiful. They're four by 12 foot windows. They don't look that big unless you get close to them. But the architect did a very good job building a church around those windows, plus other windows. That, that we so have. if you build it, he will come. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they will come, right? <laughs> How about you, Lauren? What's your experience here at the parish? What do? What are some of your first memories here? So I I, I think started attending um, St. John and Paul when I was about probably 11 or 12 years old. And so the reason why I first started coming to St. John and Paul, um, we've been members at a different parish, but at that point in my life, I had um, changed from a Catholic school to a uh, just non-religious school, so a secular school. And we really were just blown away by the faith formation program at John and Paul. And that's why parents, I made the decision that we really wanted to go to a church that was extremely engaging for youth and for children and to get my faith on fire at an early age. And so we were just impressed from the beginning with the way that uh, St. Sean and Paul did their religious education programs. I mean, from the catechists and just the way that, um, you know, they, they really prioritize the youth. So that was when I started coming here and then I was confirmed at St. Sean and Paul and the rest is history. Yeah, that's awesome. Joe, when you uh, brought your family here, uh, what were some of the things that helped your family uh, get to know the parish more? What were some of the things that you remember maybe with your wife or your children? that was helpful and, and growing up in this parish. When we years. moved here in 90, our children were all adults. They were living in other cities. So it was right. just Rita and I to start with. But uh, my senior, uh, Donardo, was very engaging. It was very, people loved him and the, the parish flourished. And uh, as I say, we built a new church that uh, held about 600 people. And in a couple of years, that was overflowing. We needed to, to build a bigger church. Soon than we expected. It's interesting. Your name is Joe, and your church of church building, uh, and in some sense, you you deserve some credit for for now Cardinal Donardo to be Cardinal Donardo, right? You can always feel like you had something to do with uh, with things like that because let's face it, he's now the Cardinal Archbishop of Houston, but he got his start here under your your guidance, right? Well, I don't know whose guidance guiding <laughs> who, but uh, it was great to be part of it, right? Uh, Lauren, uh, talk a little bit about your own background in finances and as a young adult, why you want to get involved in the church at all. What, what kind of inspired you to, to be able to be where you are in terms of the finance council here? So I, um, I went to undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh and throughout my entire college and graduate school time, I still kept attending St. John and Paul and would make the, the weekly 30 minute drive back here to go to church with my family on the weekends, which was a huge blessing. So that that really kept my faith active throughout my college years. And as I was discerning a, um, a career where I could really use my talents, I decided that I was very interested in the transaction space. So I ended up enrolling and completing um, the joint uh, JD MBA program between University of Pittsburgh School of Law and then the MU's Tupper School of Business. And I realized I, I just loved the financial world. So it, it was, very fascinating for me to be able to use both the quantitative and qualitative skills to look at a company's financial profile and how that fits into their broader strategic initiatives. But as I was discerning the right career to go into, I also wanted to make sure that it was a way that I could use my talents to serve God and to serve um, the rest of my community. And finance is not always considered the most altruistic <laughs> of careers. So I was a little bit concerned about that as I was deciding what path to take in life. And that's why I was so thrilled when I was able to join the Finance Council, because that was one of the first, I guess, ways and times that I realized that I really could use my talents for good in addition to what would be a more traditional finance career. So uh, it's it's been a, a journey for sure to find ways to be able to, to use those financial talents for good, but there certainly are opportunities. And I think it's just a really good sign that 
no matter what career path you have in life, you can use that career to serve God. And that should be the number one thing. Yeah. And, and you just joined the finance council just a little while ago. And I remember in some of our meetings, uh, you, you, you got hired as, uh, we're working with PNC or what were you? Yeah. So I was a, um, I was, uh, an associate with PNC River Arch Capital, which is PNC Bank's private equity arm. So it's a very traditional private equity firm. We were the affiliate of PNC Bank. So we essentially invested PNC Bank's capital into small to medium sized businesses. So traditionally family owned businesses, and we would help those families take their businesses and grow them to the next level. So it was uh, just very rewarding to, walk, to work across a wide variety of industries and business models. And, and the best the best part, honestly, was just um, meeting just the absolutely phenomenal management team, of these companies and getting to build relationships with them because their experience and insights being on the ground, whether it was a manufacturing business or a, um, a franchise or a pet retailer, we worked across a whole variety of different businesses. And that was just terrific experience, both professionally and personally. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, you have this great love for your family and things, and you, you discern that you'd put a pause on that in order to take care of your own family. How was that decision arrived to? And how do you feel about that? It, so come this past summer, um, my grandmother ended up getting extremely sick. So she was put on home hospice and both of my grandparents live at home still. And I, throughout June, um, which was actually a, a really busy month at work, we were closing a transaction even in the middle of COVID. The corona time as well, <laughs> I know, right. which was surprising. Uh, I would I would be going over to my grandparents' house every night and helping with my grandmother, and I saw her declining, and I saw the stress that it was putting on um, on my mom and my uncle, and I realized that, that I was getting to the point where it was really difficult for me to give 110% to both my family and my career. So uh, in July, I made the really difficult decision to actually leave my job at PNC and just fully focus on caring for my family. And that that was by far just the best decision I've made in my life. So it was something that was hard at the time, but looking back, I will never regret it. And I was able to be with my grandmother all the way up until she passed away in August. And then continue to care for both of my parents as they had, my mom had surgery, my dad's going into surgery. So it's, it's just allowed me to focus on my family, put them first. And, and it, it does, I think, raise a lot of questions in life. I mean, there are a lot of difficult moments in life. And I think that the questions that come up when you have to feel like you're prioritizing your career or your family are some of the most difficult ones. And I was just exceptionally blessed to be able to take that time away from work and use it to devote to time as my family. And I have to say, I, I have more respect for caregivers and nurses and especially any hospice teams than they, they are the true heroes. And compared to what I did, um, even the most intense days at my job were nothing compared to, to what caregivers and, and them have to go through. So that was a very eye-opening experience in many ways. So you can imagine me sitting at finance council meetings with two people like this. I walk out of them more inspired to be a better priest and like, well, what a slouch I am. And it's so inspiring to hear stories like what you're saying, because it's it, the reality is that the whole purpose of our parish is to help people get to heaven through the love of Jesus. And Jesus decided to use us as his instruments. And so to be that uh, you know, loving, caring grandchild or daughter or, or spouse to our our loved ones is the real purpose of why we're here on earth. And you two both have uh, blessed me with that. And, and Joe, with your family and obviously with your dear wife, it's just such a grace to, to do that. I was talking to your mom last night and she mentioned that your, your dear grandmother, um, they got to bring her to adoration because during Corona time, we were doing a door at the door. So we had the blessed sacrament at the window. And so your mom was so excited to be able to bring your grandmother up to be able to do adoration. And all of a sudden your grandmother like kind of sat back and looked over at your mom and said, I haven't seen Jesus in the Eucharist for two years. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, geez, what a beautiful way to truly care for somebody than to be able to bring them Jesus. And through that experience, have that peacefulness in a time that can be so challenging to think that that image and then from there to get to see the true face of Jesus in heaven. I mean, that's really what care is all about. You can definitely do the medical care but it's that loving face of Christ to be for others. And you both are great witnesses uh, to that. And I, I, I guess I say all that because 
yeah, finances are finances, but deep down, all of us, we want to do what the Lord's asking us to do and to be able to get to heaven. And, and, and so deep down, I think that's the conviction that I hope people can hear to walk through some of the um, financial questions and things that we have. Joe, before I move on, what's your career and background like? Uh, why would, I mean, I can understand why Cardinal DiNardo would want you on his team, but, uh, you know, what, what gives on your section of, the, of the, your business background? Um, um, I went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, and Catholic college in Pittsburgh. Uh -huh. And then it was, it was the time of the Korean War, and I went in the Air Force after, during the Korean War, and then I came out. And uh, I was able to get a job in a training program at JNL Steel Company, a very good training program. And the ultimate goal was to be a supervisor in the steel mill. So that's how I got started in the steel business. And I was working in Pittsburgh here for about six or seven years and saw the sort of the decline in Pittsburgh and some other places in Chicago. They were putting more money. And so we left Pittsburgh for about 25 years and came back. And uh, um, I wanted to bring up a point about stewardship, for <clears throat> father with priest. Um, I personally have a lot of respect for men who dedicate their life to the service of others. And I, you talk about caregivers and so on. I think that's part of stewardship, at least from my point, of helping the priest with the finances. You're not you're the per person who's trained to take care of people and people problems and the, and the liturgical issues. And you, all the priests need help and welcome help from a I call it a fiduciary responsibility, really, as what it is when you're in business in the banks. You have a fiduciary responsibility. It's all the prisoners should give money. They can trust that that money is being spent well. So to me, that's sort of a give back at the same time, helping a priest out and taking care of the prisoner's money. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. That's a perfect way to dovetail into why we're here today is that uh, I think most of us priests, uh, we look at our priesthood and our calling, and it's to respond to Jesus. You can see in the background of the picture there, it's the call of St. Matthew. Uh, Matthew has money in front of him, and uh, you know, he's this tax collector character, but Jesus is like, okay, now come follow me, and he leaves his money behind. But uh, in our modern-day world, we need uh, good stewards. We need our St. Joseph's to help us uh, with the caring of our people, but the, the, the fiduciary duty that you mentioned is part of can canon law, and... Um, things. So Joe, talk about some of the systems of control and the way in which our finance council runs so as to be able to give people kind of a behind the scenes look at how finance is run. There's no doubt that uh, there's lots of corruption sometimes you hear about in the church, all kinds of crazy <clears throat> finance things. How, how have we here been able to uh, steward our, our gifts here at St. John and Paul? Well, up until the COVID time, you know, we were putting a yearly budget together. We talked to the staff people before we put the budget together in the spring and we put a fiscal budget starting to every July 1st every year. And we published that in September and the parishioners knew pretty much. And, uh, but now times are different and uh, uh, we're struggling a little bit inventory and we're getting a little help from foundations and help for the pay, pay for the pre salaries. And, uh, and so it, it's a little different times now, but as far as the control, I mean, the priests never see the money here. The, we have money counters, they count the money, that day and it's deposited to the bank. And uh, you, you personally make out all the checks based on the invoices that come from the financial manager. So I think it's pretty tight control. There's no one person doing any one thing. Right, and so like on a weekly basis, I'm given these checks and I sign these checks and they all have paper uh, trails behind them. And then obviously the finance council can review all the checks that are being made out. We have bank statements that come in monthly so as to be able to check all that. They have the photocopy mm -hmm. of the check in it and those get reviewed with the frequency that's necessary. So those are some of the very basic things. It's like from offertory to, to FNB, which is where our bank account is. And then we look mm -hmm. at the, the normal expenses and all those things are very transparent. We, we run an operation based basically on checks and with that, that helps us keep those, those systems of, of control. And part of the finance uh, responsibility we've taken on through the years is a priest doesn't have time to do worry about all the maintenance mm -hmm. and the big items that are needed. Right. And so we, the finance council, we try to act as an intermediary with the maintenance people, let them know what we can afford budget wise and what we need and what we'd like to have. There's a difference in what we need, we get. And we've been able to do that through the years. Yeah. And then just to, kind of finish this 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 part we're in a special time of corona time and we, we haven't been able to do an annual budget and so 
do you remember or do you what 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 is the diocese asking us to do now to be able to have a system of cash flow in place and how have you seen that so that during this corona time when we haven't run an mm -hmm. annual budget as we traditionally did what are we doing now to keep those systems of controls in place that you've seen? Well, from a diocesan viewpoint, I think they're just looking at cash flow. They're not exactly. looking at any budgets. But when you get down to the parish, I mean, you did some things to help cut costs. We had to reduce staff. And so on a monthly, on a biweekly basis, the pastor, you know, acting as pastor, you're looking at the income and the expenses. So we're following those very closely. But as far as the diocese is concerned, they have so many problems. They're just looking at the cash see which parishes are in the deepest trouble and which ones are not. Right, so the diocese asked us to have a cash flow um, a spreadsheet sent, and that's helping us as well, keeping that transparency, but at the same time, being able to adjust things as they go. And obviously, uh, during the summer with Corona time, uh, we went through the PPP loans, we had to reduce our expenses of salaries by 40%. That was a very challenging thing, especially for community that's been so blessed at Saints John and Paul. And, in some sense, the, the one of the reasons to do this program is just update people on a more personal basis. I always hate preaching about money, so this is kind of a more casual conversation to be able to talk a little bit about the great gifts that uh, that we have. I don't know if, Lauren, if you see anything uh, being new to the Finance Council, uh, how do you see our system of controls and transparency from what your experience is? Well, I I will say I, I um, having the the legal background too. Yes. I mean, I, I have a pretty uh, pretty high standards when it comes <laughs> to compliance and control. But I think what what has really just amazed me in the time that I've been here is one we we tend to go further than even what the diocese requires in terms of our controls and our forecasts. And I know I know that we're doing um, even more cash flow forecasting than really the diocese requires, and that. The finance team here, um, actually within the the parish uh, led by Marilyn, is is really good at getting information proactively to the finance council. And I know that you yourself, RJ, have set up you know, different things that you've requested to see, and that's been just really helpful in terms of we're not just meeting the minimum requirements, but actually going that one step further. And then I think the other thing that is really impressive to me is just the quality of talent on our finance council team. That's so true. Joe being number one, who has just been an absolutely extraordinary mentor for me, but everyone else on the team just just has um, incredible backgrounds. I mean, we, we are so blessed to have the talent that we have in, in a corporate world, a lot of these people would go for extremely high salaries <laughs> and be in very high demand. So yeah, I always threaten them. If they don't show up on time, I'm going to cut their wages. And when they show up on time, we'll triple their wages. When you're dealing with zeros, it makes it easy there to make you go. those decisions. Exactly. Just tack on a few more zeros as long exactly. as the first year is zero. Yeah, that's not a big key. deal. <laughs> exactly. So. Yeah, that's true. We have a great team. And I think that's part of what canon law has put into place is that every parish has to have a finance council. We meet regularly and we review uh, where we are with with finances. Uh, Marilyn Schroeder has been just a real gift, kind of one of those angels that just comes down to bless us to be able to follow all that, prepare the, the meetings well so that we can just dive right in. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that's been a, a real blessing. But Joe, if you're you know a normal parishioner, you come into mass and you're given money at the offertory, um, where does that gift, how does this work? Can you explain a little bit of the nuts and bolts of, uh, I have a hundred dollars I'm given, uh, you know, a hundred dollars to the parish at my mass or through any of the means to give, how does a hundred dollars translate into, you know, helping us out at the parish? Well, the normal budgets, I, we would be have a million and a half a year. And actually about 500,000 that left the parish for various charities, with the assessment from the diocese and so on. And the, the payroll here, the staff takes about 90% of about 900, 800, 900,000 and the rest we use for maintenance and upkeep for the parish. But uh, uh, I'd like to talk about stewardship a little bit. Sure. And uh, in the respect of time, talent and treasure. We have a lot of professional people very busy here raising families. Mm. And the idea of if, you, if, if you're making a if you're working employed and you know you're making a decent salary that the treasure gives you an opportunity to share your treasure it, it it's a sharing that you give yourself from the heart is what you give to the church it's you what what you want to do the ministries you know as far as the time we have about 60 different ministries there's always ministries here available and and the talent that depends on what god gives you on that basis right but when money's given and somebody wants to give the money 
Does some go to parish share? Does some stay here? How does that get divided up in terms of percentage of like, because I think a lot of people are concerned. If I give $100 to Saints John and Paul, is it going to be going to other parishes like in our great grouping? How much will go to the diocese? How much stays here? Well, we have our great grouping, as you know, where the bishop set up the four churches are grouping. But right. financially, we've never separated. We, everything at St. John and Paul, all of our offertory donations and expenses, we keep the books just for St. John and Paul. And uh, so all the money donated here stays here. And uh, people can go. We have an assessment for parish share to help supply, help support the diocese and the Catholic charities. And that comes around a little over two hundred thousand dollars a year. And uh, Lauren, you can maybe talk about what we're doing with that this year. Sure. So we are actually it's it's great timing that we're having this conversation because we have just met our parish share assessment for the um, past year's period, and that is a tremendous achievement because the great news is any money that is donated to parish share from here on out stays within our our parish within saint john and paul and is not part of the assessment for the next period so that's um as joe said it's a little bit over two hundred thousand dollars and the fact that we've met that goal already um just leading into november is a witness of just the extraordinary generosity of our parishioners particularly in what's a very difficult economic time right now with the coronavirus and it's really great news for our parish because now any amount that's past that, unlike the regular offertory, is not assessed um, as part of the, the next year's amount because that's how the assessment works is that it's based on the past year's giving. And then we are given that goal to meet in the following period. So let's say, for example, last year we were gifted with a million dollars. Now, what would our assessment look like? In other words, what would we owe to the diocese for bringing in the, that type of an income? So I think the assessment is 17%, 17% right? Yeah. I, I've got my notes here, That's but okay. I thought I'd remember yeah. that one off the top of my mind. <laughs> so the assessment is 17%. And so then once we are assessed that amount off of the, um, the original million dollars in the donation, we are then required to um, collect that money through the parish share program to then give to the diocese as the assessment, which supports the diocesan activities and Catholic charities, as Joe mentioned. So with the 17%, that would come out to be $170,000. And then once the donations to the parish share program exceeded $170,000, any of that excess amount, so once we get to $171,000, that $1,000 stays within our own parish and is not part of, say, the million dollars in operatory collections that is assessed for the next year's parish share program. So in some sense, in one annual year, which starts July 1st and ends at uh, June, if we mm -hmm. brought in a, a million dollars, the money would stay here. Correct. It's just that that following uh, the time period when parish share opens, they assess that million dollars and say, OK, you're going to start a special program that will give 17 percent of that to the diocese. And that's what the parish share program. It's the sharing of our parish gifts. Once you hit the goal, this is an incentive that they built in to the diocese that once you hit that parish share goal of, you know, $170,000, for example, a million dollars, all the money that is given to parish share beyond that goal stays in our parish without it ever being assessed. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's such an exciting time now to think November, December, January, February, we have four months where if you give to parish share, all that money stays in the parish. And I think a lot of people want their their uh, their money to go to a local to the local parish and so this is a great time to be able to do that and it, it shows joe the brilliance and the wisdom that you and the pre previous pastors father mac father al and obviously dear cardinal Leonardo had of, of creating a culture here in which we would be generous with our gifts to first and foremost uh, pay to the diocese those things that were necessary that they would assess for us but yet at the same time help our parish out by knowing that once we hit that goal, the money would stay here. And that's been something a part of from the very beginning, right? The parish share well, being some generous parishes like that, had right? an annual campaign to raise money. We decided many years ago to put one envelope a month in. And that has worked very successful for us. We've always had ex extra money collected for parish share for the past mm -hmm. 20 years. How does that, what do you mean one envelope a month? Is like, uh, you know, somebody coming into throw a basket and they all say throw an envelope in how did that work what do you well, mean by well, when the envelopes are sent out or okay. when you ask for automatic giving 
you, you designate, use your parish share envelope if you're given an envelope, or when you sign up for automatic giving, you do, you can choose between offertory or parish share. Great, and it, that typically, like some people who would give electronically might do that once a month for the parish, and then they choose to do parish share the other times. So some people are given twice a month, maybe early in the month they're given a parish share, and at the end they would give towards the, the parish. Is that kind of one of the yeah, systems? Yeah, I personally have given 100% to parish share for many years. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the wisdom speaking through there, right? And it, it does seem counterintuitive in a way, because right. if you want your money to stay within the parish and help the parish, it makes sense to give it to just the parish rather than parish share. But it, it really is, I mean, it's a, it's a message that Father Mac promoted and that we still promote today because it really is in the best interest of the parish to meet that goal and then we get the two-pronged benefit of one, anything past the goal we get to keep here, and two, it's not part of the assessment. Yeah, right. So Lauren, talk about the different ways to, uh, to give money. Uh, recently with COVID, we've expanded our opportunities to make it easier for people to give um, you being kind of tech savvy and electronically uh, more, uh, well, let's say more savvy than Joe I and I. <laughs> Tell us what are some of the easy ways to give money and what are the normal ways that, uh, that you would like to just talk about? So, of course, there's the traditional way that if you if you do come into Mass in person, you um, can donate in either cash or check or through your envelope in the baskets, which we now have placed um, in the narthex. And, right. uh, and so that's something... To keep in mind that we do have those available so make sure to watch out for them when you pick up your evangelion and mm -hmm. get your hand sanitizer <laughs> put your so, mask on put your mask on All these pre-gaming ways to get into mass <laughs> so it is it is still possible to give in the traditional sense and we're also hoping that as more people feel comfortable coming back to mass that they will also um you know feel more comfortable once again uh donating their um their money and and uh, in, in a generous way so there's the traditional method, and then there's methods that people maybe aren't so aware about, and that's the online giving program. So we we do have two ways to give online. One is um, through First National Bank and their electronic giving program, and that is um, a great way, definitely the most economically friendly way for St. John Paul to give, because you can set it up where you have um, a recurring electronic giving through this program. Uh, the, the links can be found on the parish website. And there's an automatic withdrawal of those funds initiated by St. John Paul on the 5th and 25th of each month. So we are, are getting that money that you donate through the online giving um, on a bi-monthly basis. And that's a great way to just minimize transaction expenses on our part and just have a way that you can set up recurring giving without having to think about it, without having to have your cash, write your check or get your envelope. And there's- And that's just stuff for you. And people your age, how often are people whipping out a checkbook or cash to like pay for things, would you say? I oddly <laughs> like writing checks. Oh, you do like checks, okay. <laughs> which is maybe <laughs> strange, a little bit dated. Okay, good. But no, the, in, in all seriousness though, the, the online giving is is a great way to um, just make sure that you, you do have your support set that you want through the parish. You don't have to think about it. You can set or change your amounts as needed. Um, and that's just a, a nice way and an economically friendly way for the parish to make sure that um, you uh, you know are giving what you are are comfortable giving. So right. that's the thing. And there we currently have 214 participating in the electronic giving program, um, and uh, that's just for the direct offertory. So as we talked about earlier, and then we have 146 enrolled in the parish share electronic giving. So that's another nice thing about the electronic giving program is that you can choose whether you'd like to give to the offertory or whether you'd like to give to parish share as we discussed those differences earlier. And then there's another way to it's the e-Catholic online giving and you initiate that donation. Um, you can pay through credit card, uh, debit card, automatic withdraw. And we have 113 active members in that program um, and on a monthly basis, we, we typically, um, get a recurring amount of around, uh, 16 to $17,000. So those are, are both just, um, I mean, the generosity of our parishioners already through the electronic giving programs, particularly during COVID when a lot of people haven't felt comfortable coming into mass has, has been just 
incredible, the level of support that we've seen. And even when people can't physically be here, I know that the live stream has been a tremendous success. And that's also a way for people to, to donate their treasures without physically having to come in in person. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a great way to give. Yeah, it's been it's been very moving to see uh, the amount of sacrifice that people will make to sustain their parish and and our work here. Uh, I can say that for uh, for me and the priests, we we meet on Wednesdays, and they're they are some of the most hardworking priests that have ever been with. They we have not shied away from having almost twenty weekend masses outdoor, every type of experience you could have, uh, and uh, online streaming and radio stations and. And, and really just doing our best to try to um, uh, offer uh, at least uh, that presence of Christ in the Eucharist, uh, trying to do safe baptisms and, and Corona time weddings. It's been juggling all those things. And we even were able to, to get confirmations in, and in a safe way. We've, we've multiplied confirmations to have uh, five different confirmations. So all these are efforts that have been supported by our, our parish. Well, don't you think our church has been out front as far as all the churches on the North Hills that our attendance is up and our activities and masses available? Yeah, much more as than I've any been interacting. Church? Yeah, it's well, really well said. Uh, I've, I've been interacting with our different priests and, and the people around. Uh, you know, in June when we were allowed to, we, we started into having the indoor masses as well as the outdoor masses. And like what your dear uh, grandmother got to experience of, of having the Eucharistic adoration uh, in a very devout and, and, and venerable place, but at the same time, you could stay in your car and, and do adoration. We're all uh, ways of doing that. And then this particular program, Exploring Catholicism, got kicked off on Holy Thursday, in which we couldn't do Holy Week masses. It was crazy. And so, uh, you know, with the great staff that's supported through the generosity of our parish, we were able to pull together these types of programs that just give another angle to be able to evangelize and connect. I think the quarantining of our people it can be very isolating. And so both mm -hmm. through the sacramental life and through, uh, you know, online things that we're able to try to connect a little bit more uh, with, with our people. So talk a little bit about uh, where our money goes, um, why uh, perhaps uh, it, or it's, or let's get into why. Why do you think people should be giving? What are the benefits in, in your mind, Joe, that you talked a little bit now about getting people together and, and being able to see this, but what are some of the other reasons that you found in your life or just in, in just being in this parish that have paid off for, for giving your hard-earned money to, to the parish? I think it comes from the heart sharing your treasures, as I said before. I mean, right. it's so, someone to tell you what you have to give or 10% or something. I think people truly should give what they give, want to give from the heart rather than a number. And, and I think that's more meaningful to the person. And, Usually it's more meaningful to the church if people really want to share their treasure. Yeah. And I think, I don't know about for you, Lauren, what, what, what motivates you to want to give or how, uh, inspire people to give? What would be the reasons for that? I think it's a, a variety of things. One is is just the, the faith aspect. So mm -hmm. just the fact that this, I mean, this parish has been my home for a really long time. And I feel just so um, close to Jesus when I'm in the church, the the fact that there's adoration, um, the the adoration effort that you mm -hmm. and, and the rest of the priests and parish staff have put forward has been incredible. I, I hope sometime soon we can get back to the 24 seven adoration. <laughs> oh, me but too. That um, just the, the way that the priests and parish staff really help to develop um, mine, everyone else's relationship with God. I, I want to make sure that that continues and that you have the resources to continue to be able to do that. And I think the other aspect, because it's also close to my heart as it's why I first joined St. John Paul is just the faith formation and the emphasis on her youth, which is, um, I think truly is one of the best faith formation programs in the area. And so seeing how the, the money that will give directly um, translates to having a phenomenal faith formation team, supporting the staff there, supporting the resources for the children, the activities. Um, it's just really all inspiring. And then all of the rest of the things that the parish does through the outreach programs, uh, marriage enrichment ministry, there's um, just so many, so many ministries and, and also things too that I, I saw um, from just how involved the, the community is after we after my grandmother passed away, we got um, a call from just the kindest parishioner mm. checking how we were doing. And um, just just seeing that level of, of closeness, you 
you want to support your family and you want to make sure that your family is able to thrive and money is is an unfortunate um you know thing to have to talk about when you just want to focus on god but it is it is still something that is necessary to support all the tremendous talent that we have here and just to make sure that our um our beautiful church and all of the resources uh have what they need yeah i agree and i, I can't agree with you more that me coming from a small family, I feel like parish life is just an extension of family. And you both uh, exude that in the way you, you speak about being a sermon in the parish here. And, you know, when you look at our families struggling now during Corona time, you see the world with our elections and the things, the challenges that we have right now, you can't help but see that the family is at the, at the core of our community and the core of our parish. And, um, I guess uh, for me, it's it's to see the numbers coming in and, and be grateful for the generosity, but also knowing that um, you know we've been able to stabilize things since July, but we see different ebbs and flows of things. And so, in some sense, it's almost like a, a desire in my heart to, to to wonder if it's possible for some people to to take advantage of this opportunity over these next four months to give to parish share and to really increase the direct amount of money that would come to our parish. Or to consider in your um, normal offertory to think about, well, maybe five to ten dollars more could be something of a way of as we go through uh, this Corona time to help our parish and to continue growing our parish uh, the way I think that the Lord is asking us to, to do that. It's a, it's exciting time, but I think also think it's a it's a challenging time for us to to be able to to do that. To talk a little bit about some of the fundraising opportunities like the golf outing and things and how you've seen that become. You had mentioned that uh built into the very programming of the money here that it, it obviously goes into the operational accounts like paying the salaries the utility bills but you also mentioned that a good share of money also goes to help out community and, and people in need yeah we have well, as i mentioned in a normal year of save a million and a half dollars and the diocese actually gets 27 percent 17 percent for a diocese and if you do not have your own school it's a 10 percent so Correct. Uh, to help the Catholic schools uh, but all the collections that we have each year in the diocese, there's 12 special collections, one each month, and all that money, that added up goes to almost like a half million dollars that leaves the parish. We're left with about a million or so to run the operation. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, and then, well, we're just sticking with that before I got to talk about the golf out. It's, a, you know, you see St. Anthony's out. program, you see the education fund, uh, you know, some <clears> of the special <throat> needs opportunities. and. You know, and then the youth work that's being done, it's uh, it's really, it is uh, incredible to see the generosity and how our money definitely is it's staying here to help us, but also can help with some great charitable work that's going on. But specifically more the golf outing, how did that get started? Did you well, kind of first of all, it's going back, it, it, we spent about two and a half million dollars to build the Cardinal Donardo Center. Right. And about a million of that was getting the land ready and the utilities and so on. And we paid that off quite quickly in a couple of years. And we and we had a, we were in an excess of budget around two hundred thousand dollars a year from late nineties into the two thousands, and we were starting to look to build a new church. And we felt we had a million two to start building a new church, and then we ended up buying a piece of land for a million two. And uh, we thought the diocese was going to pay for the land, but they didn't. So we had to pay <laughs> for it and start all over again. But <clears throat> We, you know, spending eleven million dollars to build a church. We were about halfway through our, our campaign, and my person was thinking, "Well, well we're going to collect five million and have a five million dollar mortgage." And I was gulping at that a little bit. That was two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year interest. So, but by the time we finished building the church, the collections kept coming in, and we paid the church off within about a year after the church was completed. Uh, the golf outing was part of that. Uh, we started out as a golf outing uh, the, the Friday after Labor Day. We we did it for 15 years. Uh, first couple of years was twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and we ended up getting up fifty thousand dollars a year. The, we ended up at six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars for 15 years toward the building fund. So that was a big input to it. And I have to say, if you look at the plaque upstairs in the building in the new church. There's a hundred families who gave over five million dollars to this church. I mean, wow. the generosity is there. The, the stewardship when people give when they feel they really, really want to give from the heart. That's true. And, yeah. Oh, and ahead, giving, sir. giving can just even what I've I've realized can bring so much joy. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. Even if you don't have um, the treasures to give, giving your time or your talent and 
it really, whatever you give, you get back in so many ways. And, and that's something that um, I think we, we saw in the way of, of people giving to support the building of the church. And it was, it was given back by both the, the feeling that you really made a sacrifice and to build this, this beautiful church where so many incredible things have happened. I mean, so many um, baptisms and marriages and funerals and masses and um, it's just such a, a beautiful thought. And I think that regardless of what people give, even if they aren't able to give financially, you you are rewarded in, in so many ways. And that's something that I, I think is um, that I've really experienced in my own life. And uh, I, I just want to keep giving. It makes, yeah. me, makes me happy. An, an example I appreciate is, that. <laughs> you know, an example of talent is the campaign uh, committee to for the funds for the right. raise of funds, the, Don Lo, oh, the campaign to build the to build the, the church. church. Okay, yeah, yeah talk to us. About uh, there was a committee that I, I don't really know who they were, but uh, but they instead of going out and paying seven percent for a professional fundraiser, this committee uh, uh, had pledges and collected eleven million dollars to preach the new church. I mean, they had wine and cheese parties with Father Mac, but they knew what they were doing. They had some professional people who who did development work, but we're on that committee. But they, they did a great job of fundraising. There was a lot of talent in this church. That's very true. Oh, I agree. It's, it's an honor to, to see the amount of, of love that's gone into this. You know, just the other day, uh, we were talking about uh, feeding, uh, building 100,000 meals uh, through a program called Amen to Action. And, uh, you know, there's meal making. There's all kinds of wonderful programs going on to help those who need, especially during uh, Corona time. And somebody mentioned you can come in and help build these meals, 100,000 of them in a four hour period on November 14th. And then somebody said, but if Corona time or just a safety right now, you feel like you want to stay at home, another way to participate is to offer some funding. And I think the same thing now, we're, we're a little bit more than 50% participation in mass, which is very good for where we are with time. And the gang, geez, if, if you can't come to mass and still want to participate, that's another opportunity to, to be able to, to be able to do that during, during this Corona time. You know, one thing that just kind of popped into my mind um, is that, uh, so uh, yesterday I went back to my old parish of St. Simon and Jude where I was pastor and it was a moving experience. I haven't really been back there in that capacity in, in two mm -hmm. years. And, it was, you know, you see some of your old friends and some of us there. And I went back because uh, uh, I was asked by the pastor to be able to come celebrate the, the, the funeral of one of the great care ministers. He ran St. Vincent de Paul. He came on our youth mission trips. Uh, he was a policeman. Uh, he helped with the parking. I mean, he was uh, always present. And it was interesting because there were four pastors present at this wow. mass. So he just left a great le legacy, mm -hmm. Bob Doyle. An Irishman, it obviously brings out the greatest dogma ever that it's not necessary to be Irish to get to heaven, but why take the risk? <laughs> but I'm going on a little, uh, little project I don't want to get to. But my point is this, is that when, he, uh, when his family wrote the obituary, at the end, it said all the gifts, uh, both he had left uh, money and, and wanted to remember St. Simon and Jude in his will. And he encouraged all those gifts and little flowers type of thing to go to his parish of St. Simon and Jude. Um, I think that's a huge challenge today. When I read the obituaries and consider those who have passed, uh, many times it's, it's whoever is at the very end, the last few days with them, in lieu of flowers and gifts go there. And I wonder um, how you two feel about these kind of legacy gifts and, and considering the opportunity to be able to remember your parish um, at, at the moment that the Lord's gonna be calling you. Because I feel like if we do anything in this church, I hope it's to inspire people to be close to Christ so they get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And I want what organization is doing more for the eternal rest of our souls than our parish. I don't know if you guys have had any thoughts on on well, we on have an ad in a bulletin. I make sure it's in there for the last 20 years. <laughs> Remember St. John and Paul in your will. <laughs> okay, so why would you put that in there? Because that's just a reminder to people, just, just the point you're making, to share the treasure or that maybe that person who deceased would like it to go there. Right. Yeah, I, I know for myself, it's like, gosh, if, if we've been blessed with this, and you know, and you know, obviously, you can't take a U-Haul truck to the funeral home with you because you're, you're not going to have much to carry. You're just going to be yourself and your body. And at that point, so it seems to me that uh, you know, especially now we're in this period where we're remembering the, the souls, the dear souls, and stuff. We had one time. prisoner last year, you know, through probate court, 
they donated hundred thousand dollars to this parish. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is a good time for us as you know, you're watching this at home to wonder, do I want to bless my parish with uh, perhaps a legacy gift, right? I don't know, Lauren, what are your thoughts on this? It's actually an interesting question because one of the very first jobs that I had was working for a nonprofit organization that did disaster relief work. And um, in that role, I, I did some finance functions, but one of one of the things I did was let, lead actually the plan giving program. So, and, and they didn't have a very large plan giving program at that time, but we would work with families who were interested in donating um, through their will of certain amounts to our nonprofit organization. And what was amazing, because I spent a lot of time talking to different people who were going through the stages of considering what charities to give to, making sure that their own children or anything that they had was still taken care of, was just the sense of peace that they had when it was all set. And just knowing that um, knowing that they would continue to give even after they were here on earth. And then also it, it gives peace of mind, I think, to have that plan. So to know in advance, to not leave it up to um, the children or any other family members in terms of thinking, what would my parents' wishes be? And I think that it's it's a really beautiful way to um, structure it so that you can continue um, giving and give that final gift while also making sure that your assets go to the places that you want them to go, whether that is your your family or charities, um, or in this case, the church, which I agree with you is is one of the best possible places to give to. And I think that um, you know, it really does make for a beautiful gesture. So that's something that, you know, I would, I would definitely encourage people to take into consideration because I personally witnessed just how, um, rewarding that can be to plan ahead of time. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's such a blessing to, to think about, uh, when you look at the big cathedrals and you look at some of the great churches around the world, uh, those families who either donated bricks, time or mortar, or those who were willing to had uh, finances and could donate their money to it. And you, you think not just physically, although obviously the physical structures of the church took money and a lot of time, treasure and talent, but also spiritually mm -hmm. and how important that is as a parish. And just to wonder, it doesn't matter how much money you have. The question is, what is the Lord putting on your heart to be able to gift to our parish and to the parishes? And I uh, can't think of, uh, you know, uh, a better way to to thank the Lord than just praising Him for all that we've been given, and you know, Thanksgiving is coming up. I'm very grateful for all those who have, have been able to to do that. And I just one little programming note about the great grouping is that um, obviously this is a perspective from Saints John and Paul, and uh, at a later date, I'm going to do a perspective from our Valley parishes of Good Samaritan, Saint John the Baptist, and Our Lady of Peace. But I found it interesting, Joe, that even in your own background in the steel industry and seeing uh, how that has allowed you to forge ahead to where you are now. And I think of our people in the valley who have had to um, overcome so many uh, challenges, both with the steel industry and, uh, and with parishes there, that despite the fact that we're kind of the new kids on the block up here, but yet at the same time, you know, you look at St. John the Baptist and that was started around the Civil War. And, you know, I live in the, in the Beaver Valley, so it's so interesting, this, the drive to come from the Ohio River Boulevard area there and then drive up to here and go back and forth there. And, and one of the things that's just been so inspiring to see is how when we come together as a community, it's amazing the fruits and the benefits that have happened. And although we're still what we call four EIN numbers, we're still four bank accounts, we're still four parishes, uh, you know, we've been able to unite under a charity like the Food Pantry where these last few months, over $250,000 of either supplies or money have come from our parishes to support over a thousand people a week and feeding, uh, uh, you know, a program that's helped the hybrid model of, you know, a safe haven for school. Well, the bottom line is faith, isn't it? It is, yeah, <laughs> that's probably the best <laughs> way to say it. Oh, no, I agree, it is faith. <laughs> and, uh, and to that end, just to kind of finish, Lauren, um, a little well, your mom kind of told me about the fact that you had decided to take up a book called the consecration to saint yes. joseph and you know being with the saint joseph to our right here yeah. and, <laughs> you know i thought it was fitting to kind of finish how we began with that deeper spiritual look at at that saint joseph so i actually did an exploring catholicism with the author of that book brother oh, don wow. calloway 
um, months ago. And I did the consecration of St. Joseph mm -hmm. personally at the beginning of, of this year, and it kind of ended right as COVID started. So I can't think of a better saint to turn to because he's been right there for me. But when you think of St. Joseph and you know your experiences with him, I, I mean, it was as if when God designed the Holy Family, he had Mary be perfect and Jesus be the son of God. And then this dear guy, he probably got blamed for anything that went wrong because everybody else was perfect in the household. So why St. Joseph? What, 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 what's what been some of the fruits of, of reading that book called The Consecration to St. Joseph? Phenomenal book. And yeah. and it was, I think, one of the most eye-opening things for me when I started this, um, this consecration, which I'm doing together with my mom. Oh, so, so right great. there is a nice mother-daughter bonding activity. But um is is that when i started the book and it's it's a fairly substantial book and i thought okay what is he going to write about we just don't know that much about saint joseph and the fact that um there are no spoken words by saint joseph in scripture and we we don't really know that much in terms of the actual writings about his life but um the book is extraordinary because it it goes into details about just how incredibly selfless St. Joseph was. And from the very beginning of just his complete trust in God, um, his complete love and care and protection of Mary and Jesus, uh, the way that he, he protected them as he took them into Egypt, he brought them back and was just this extraordinary father figure. And I think that what has been really inspiring to me is that St. Joseph had to take a back seat a little bit. And it talks a lot about how we don't really hear a lot about us, about St. Joseph in scripture because uh, Jesus wanted to really emphasize the fact that God was his father and that he is God and the son of God. And that there could have been created some confusion at the time if St. Joseph would have taken a much larger role in scripture. So he did have to take a little bit of that back seat, but he is the greatest saint of all times because he um, he just did everything in honor and glory of God. And he was just an incredible model of workmen. So the fact that he had a career, he was a carpenter, but he used that career to um, in, in thanks and praise for God. He um, he took care of Jesus. He was the the pillar of families and and I think that just seeing his, him and how he was such a witness to faith and care and protection and love and just complete giving of all of his time, talents and treasures mm -hmm. to Jesus and to Mary um, has just been incredible to read. And now I, I have great affection for St. Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I think, three days left in the book. So oh, I'm that's finished. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And when you look biblically at the character of Joseph, Joseph in the Old Testament, plays a, a tremendous role in charitable giving. Mm -hmm. You know, ironically, he would be thrown into slavery and basically sold by his brothers. And years later, they would come during a time of famine, similar to almost like Corona time, and they didn't know who he was. And now imagine these brothers coming up to him and he was serving in a place that had a lot of money and, and wealth in Egypt. And there they came up to him. And you almost wonder, he could have done anything he wanted to them. And he embraced them and then he generously gave to them uh, just such a great image uh joseph in the old testament obviously saint joseph donating his bob the builder mm -hmm. <laughs> type of characteristics to build the family home and to take care of of uh of mary and uh and uh, jesus any last thoughts from you joe before we close up the i, do, I had a question of you oh, you have a question for me uh, you're not allowed to ask questions to me i'm the kind of the, the director of this here I yes, hold, another, i'm holding the sheets here we'll do another hour interview reverse it <laughs> time we ask you the question all right well you, yeah you guys get any question you want spending all the time you did in mexico i wondered what your impression was your thoughts when you first went into our grotto and saw our, our lady of guadalupe <laughs> grotto oh well that's not a fair question to ask i have uh, her ring Right here with me, I got to spend seven years in uh, Mexico and at least once a month, sometimes even more, I would go to uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe and the beautiful grotto there dedicated to the Mother of God that appeared miraculously in, in Mexico in 1531. So at my ordination, I'm getting ordained and we have this huge image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's like as if hey, she's just, I was about to speak in Spanish, sorry. Hey, yeah. <laughs> and she follows me around and she's, she always protects me. So when I was told that I was coming to this great grouping, I had been to St. John, a uh, uh, Good Samaritan once for the St. Anthony um, Novena. 
I hadn't been to the other parishes, but I had heard about the grotto here. And so when I was on the phone with Father Mark Ekman, I was in the car driving, I was leaving Ligonier actually. And I remember I pulled over and he's like, all right, we got your assignment. And I'm like, uh, what is it? And he goes, Saints John of Paul, Our Lady of Peace, St. John the Baptist, Good Samaritan. My mind instantly went to, I can't wait to be able to be in that grotto. And, and so it's, I don't know if there's a better workplace than being literally two rooms away from that grotto. And I don't ever want to get used to that. How ironic could Father Mac put in that Our Lady Guadalupe grotto and then you came. It's in the heart of our church <laughs> is our Blessed Mother yeah. with the Guadalupe Grotto, which I still don't know exactly why Our Lady of Guadalupe. I mean, I, I know why I would put Our yeah. Lady of Guadalupe. And there's so many beautiful manifestations of Our Lady to walk into there, see St. Juan Diego, and yeah. then the beautiful flower, which is obviously on her womb, which is where Jesus would have rested in, on her garment, and then to see her miracle eyes out there. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I can say that I'll never get used to walking okay. into that grotto. And um, one of the things that I felt early on was that grotto could be um, uh, really developed even more by making it a Eucharistic chapel um, so that, uh, you know, before Corona time, we had basically 24-7 adoration yep. going there. And what a beautiful way to be able to honor uh, that grotto that Father Mac and all of you so generously gave to build and uh and then being able to do that and now we pause adoration and we'll do weddings down there we do baptisms down there uh, unfortunately the daily mass is, has been postponed due to spatial issues but hopefully at some point we better get ba back to doing some of those daily mass experiences mm -hmm. uh there so yeah i appreciate that um so i, I just uh, can't thank uh, you two enough for coming on the program i hope that those who are watching can get a little bit of better sense of who are the people behind the scenes helping us priests, because let's face it, uh, my family might have a career in, in finances. I do not. I absolutely wanted to dive into being a missionary priest, uh, working in Mexico, and now the Lord's blessed me with a mission here in the Pittsburgh area. I hope it gives some confidence to those who are wondering, what happens to my money? Why should I give to the Catholic Church? There's no doubt that our history, more recently, has had all kinds of stuff go in and out terms of who the Catholics are, priests and stuff like that. But I think deep down it has to do with that great trust that Jesus Christ empowered this church through his hierarchy. And despite the fact that priests can come and go, there is a very stable a group of lay people who help oversee this and help steward this, those types of St. Joseph's, if you will. And in our parish here at St. John and Paul, in a great grouping, we have tremendous people who help me uh, do that. So really a special thanks to Marilyn Schroeder, who has been a tremendous uh, blessing for us, and Eileen Karshen in the Valley, and all those who have served on the, the, the Finance Council. If anyone does have any questions or would like to review or just go deeper in it, both me and I know Marilyn and our Finance Council would uh, would welcome any discussions that would go further uh, to be able to um, yeah continue to feel that confidence, transparency, and the good use of our gifts. So let's just close with uh, and our Father, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Luke, pray for us. St. John the Baptist, pray for us. Saints John and Paul, Pray, pray for, for us. us. Our Lady of Peace. Pray, pray, pray for, us. for us. Father, Son, Holy so Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.